All right. Parag Patel from Chicago, currently in Michigan. I'm presenting for you from the shores of Lake Michigan. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you. And certainly at the invite of our dear friend, AJ, um, I represent the Foundation for International Cardiac and Community Services. We're based in Nairobi. Um, I'm an interventional cardiologist with a deep passion for educating and learning. And what I'm hoping to walk you through today are some very basics in rhythm assessment, uh, really diagnosis today. I want you to be comfortable and, and learn a new strategy to demystify uh, EKG's rhythm strips. And we're hoping then to continue in partnership with AJ and his team to provide some basic cardiac education um, over the next few months. So uh, I'll let AJ, if you may have already given them a little intro. No, I think I think that was a fantastic uh, intro, and we're very excited to hear from uh, from Dr. Patel and the Global Fix team. Uh, for those of you who haven't already uh, had a chance to interact, you know they they did an amazing presentation at Africa STEMI this past year, our past month in Nairobi, and uh, we're looking forward with the Cardiovascular Education Foundation and the Dennis and G Jane Reese Foundation to continue this partnership and continue these remote teachings as well as in person. So, Dr. Patel, if you want to take it from here. Super excited. I will. Uh, we want engagement. And I know in the Zoom format, it's tough. Uh, and AJ is going to help me. Uh, but we want you to learn. And I find, right, sometimes getting a little anxious about learning is a good way. This is a safe space to learn in, uh, particularly when it's remote like this. So I'm going to jump right in. This slide, I'd encourage all of you, if you're on laptops or if you're on your mobile, do a screenshot and save this. This is fundamental to how we teach. Um, you want to know if your patient clinically always is stable or unstable. You want to know if the rhythm that you're looking at, is it fast or is it slow? Is the QRS narrow or wide? And is the rhythm irregular or regular? These steps will allow you to assess any rhythm. And we we want you to repetitively use this today, but use it in your clinical practice. Is the patient having chest pain, shortness of breath? Are they hypotensive? Are they hypoxic? Those are clinical signs of instability. Then we have to act sooner. Is the rhythm rapid or slow, right? Is that QRS narrow or wide? And is the regularity between the R to R's stable or varying beat to beat? Again, take a screenshot, take a snapshot on your phone. This is fundamental to demystifying and making things easy. I'd love to get some engagement here. And again, we'll use this strategy. I'm going to tell you the patient is clinically unstable, hypotensive, dizzy. I'd like someone to try to walk through this and tell me, number one, is it fast or is it slow? Please chime in. We wanna make this interactive and then it'll give me an idea if I'm actually doing anything meaningful here. I'm not gonna to touch any of the top bars, HA, for fear of locking this up. So if you wanna give me any feedback or if you wanna call out some people in the chat, I'm unable to see the chat while I'm presenting right now. Yeah, so everyone here in the chat is saying slow. Excellent. And are we then in a rhythm that is regular or irregular? And I'm leaving this open for folks in the chat to answer. We're seeing irregular. Good. And is the QRS narrow or wide? So we've got a clinically unstable patient with a slow heart rhythm that is irregular. And what are we hearing on the QRS side? You know, we're, we're hearing both wide and narrow. Yeah, so, and it can be perplexing. Yeah, yeah, and I and I actually am in agreement with that. Uh, that you've got sometimes it's hard to know. In certain images, it looks like the QRS is a little wider. Um, in others, it looks narrow. So that's fair. 
Uh, do we have anyone in the chat that wants to go out on a limb and try to tell us what the rhythm is? It's a slow rhythm, a QRS that might be slightly wide. It's irregular in the short rhythm strip we have. What do we have there for responses? Oops, sorry. Any feedback there, EJ? Uh, so far, someone says junctional rhythm. Okay. Yeah, and so if we, and it may be difficult to see, I can't zoom the screen in, but if you look very closely, there are P waves there and there appears to be some disassociation. So probably likely a high grade complete heart block. And again, with a clinically unstable patient, you might try a little pharmacologic intervention. Um, if they're hypotensive, some type of agent that's gonna cause vasoconstriction peripherally and beta agonism, so norepinephrine, dopamine. It would not be wrong to use those agents while you stabilize and then think strongly if they're clinically unstable about if you have access to external pacing and then certainly a transvenous pacemaker might be necessary, but excellent job by the group. Okay, we're gonna have somebody else again with that same template. Is this fast or slow? Are we regular or irregular? Is the QRS narrow or wide? I'm gonna tell you up front, the patient does not have a pulse, so we are clinically unstable. So I'd like the group pretty quickly, since we have no pulse and the patient is dying to give me a diagnosis and treatment. What do we hear in AJ? I've got uh, no perfusion going to the brain. We're hearing torsades. We're hearing V-fib. Good. Torsades, right between the Excellent. Two. Excellent. And it really doesn't matter what you call it. This is a life-threatening rhythm. There is no medical therapy that is going to save this patient. It requires the immediate assessment that there's no pulse, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, effective chest compressions, and then somebody getting help and getting a defibrillator to shock this patient. Without a defibrillator, this rhythm is not going to perfuse the brain and the patient is not gonna survive. All right, so if we use our same template again for our, our international community there, is this fast or slow? Is it narrow or wide? Is it regular, irregular? This patient is presenting with symptoms of chest pain. They're short of breath. They're hypoxic with a saturation of 80%. So this would make it a clinically unstable rhythm. So in the chat box there, please chime in. What are we getting for responses uh, to our question? Very fast, wide, VT. Excellent. Uh, a lot of people are saying cardioversion. Great. So uh, good recognition there. So fast rhythm, wide, regular, clinically unstable. Uh, we're going to introduce concepts that make uh, the ACLS algorithm very simple. When you have extremes and someone is fast and clinically unstable, most of the time the therapy is going to be a shock. So we've just simplified the entire ACLS algorithm. Fast, clinically unstable, probably shock. Now, certainly the caveat there is you wanna make sure it's not a sinus tachycardia, but it doesn't matter if it's narrow or it's wide. If they're clinically unstable and they have a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia or ventricular tachycardia, electricity and a shock is the answer. I'll say that again. Clinically unstable tachycardia that is either supraventricular or ventricular tachycardia should get a shock. And so recurrent themes we're going to stress. The nuances of how to read a 12 lead will be introduced in later sessions. We want to rec uh, work on quick pattern recognition today. Another example 
of a rhythm that can get confusing. So we'd like to hear your input on this, where you have number one, is it fast or is it slow? Is it wide or narrow? Is the QRS here? Uh, you know, how do you assess that? Is it regular, irregular? And again, this patient is clinically unstable with a blood pressure of 80 over 60 millimeters of mercury, complaining of shortness of breath and dizziness. AJ, what are we getting there on our responses? So we're seeing um, ventricular tachycardia, fast, wide, regular run of VTAC, synchronized shock. Good. Fast, wide, regular VT. Okay, so we're seeing fast, wide, regular. Now, this one is, you know, tricky. If you look at the bottom rhythm strip there, uh, which represents lead two. So everything else is part of the 12 lead, but lead two is the continuous rhythm strip. There you can see a clear twisting of axis, right? So this would be polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. If associated with a prolonged QT, could be torsades. So this is that, you know, unique hybrid rhythm, clinically unstable, treated the same way. It's a tachycardia, not sinus rhythm, clinically unstable treatment is shock. Now, to just clarify the difference between cardioversion and defibrillation, we go back, this rhythm can only be defibrillated because there's an inability of the defibrillator to recognize an organized QRS. So the energy is given at any point in the cycle to try to restore sinus rhythm. When there is an organized rhythm like this, it's better to cardiovert to avoid delivering energy in the vulnerable period and causing essentially this rhythm, which is torsades. You can take a clinically stable patient, might even be with SVT or AFib, and if you deliver energy into the vulnerable period of repolarization, you will create polymorphic VT, which sometimes can be a wicked challenge to get people out of it. You could lose the patient. So always cardiovert if you can synchronize the energy to an organized rhythm. If it's a ventricular fibrillation, you defibrillate. It can't organize when to deliver that QRS. So I hope that is clear. And again, in the chat box, please let me know if there are uh, steps along the way that I can restate uh, or discuss further. Don't hesitate. We want this to be a learning experience. Uh, before I jump to the next, uh, any responses there, uh, AJ, that I need to address? Uh, no, I mean, looks like people were saying torsades, VTAC, different opinions there as far as um, the actual rhythm itself. So the people asking about the recording, uh, we will have this available on YouTube within the next day or so. So don't even worry if you're not able to uh, recap it. We'll have it available. Great. All right. We're going to move forward again using the same strategy. We want to get some feedback. This patient is clinically stable. It's being seen in the casualty department for intermittent episodes of palpitations, on occasion some mild lightheadedness. So number one, is it fast or is it slow? Is the QRS narrow or wide? Is it regular or irregular? And then we'll throw in the caveat now as we're, we're learning how to address these. Is there a P wave? And what is the relationship of the P wave to the QRS? So let's get some feedback, please. Um, and then we can, uh, we can break this rhythm down. What are you getting there, uh, AJ? We're seeing slow, rate drop. Someone said winky box, second degree heart block, Mobitz type one. Excellent. So we've got we've got a a, a very uh, a tuned in crowd. So I love to hear that. So we'll walk through that. We do see bradycardia. There appears to be at least one P wave for each QRS, but certainly in instances there looks like there's two. 
And that PR interval seems to be prolonging, and then there's a drop B. So this is second degree type one, otherwise known as wanky Bach block, a benign rhythm that maybe I put one pacemaker in for this rhythm in the last 26 years. Um, it's rare that this individual would require a pacemaker. It's often asymptomatic, but if they do have significant bradycardia, and particularly if they have chronotropic incompetence, meaning that as they try to walk or exercise, the heart rate doesn't increase, then that would be a unique setting that a pacemaker would be required. Okay, who's gonna take a stab at this one? We sort of have a rhythm that might classify as both, either fast or slow, depending on which part of the rhythm strip you wanna look at. Uh, certainly there are some wide and wider complexes. Uh, I think everyone would agree it's irregular. Uh, this patient is intermittently getting near syncopal, so nearly passing out and then they're fine. Uh, what are we getting from our audience uh, feedback as far as uh, the rhythm? on this. Perfect. And uh, Dr. Kuz is also on the panel as well. He's going to uh, help us out with calling out some of the uh, some of the chat just because I'm in a loud environment. Um, oh, but that's great. Yes, we, we are... need who is involved. He, he's probably lying on a beach in Zanzibar somewhere. <laughs> he's struggling. <laughs> so we do see some RNT, run of VTAC, torsades, polymorphic VT, some said NSVT. Dr. Kuz, I don't know what you're seeing. Yes, uh, some of people are saying sinus transition into VT, polymorphic VT, and uh, uh, yeah, I think torsades and VT. So more, uh, more or less VT, polymorphic VT. Yeah. Good, and this could be, and maybe Kuz, you can help uh, certainly direct the audience on how uh, we might manage this in Dar es Salaam. Yeah, def definitely. So. Um, if, if because this is an unstable patient, we can we can definitely you need to cardio with this patient because you can see a sinus and turning into a runs of Uchi. So yep, to cardio yeah, with so this patient. It's sustained and and sometimes the challenge yes. is as you can see on this rhythm strip, it comes and goes, and so yes. then it it may be you know if 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 we can getting some medical therapy on board and just you know you can observe it this type of brief. As long as they're supine, well, the individual will probably continue to perfuse their brain as long as they're not upright. And that may give us some time to be thoughtful on, you know, what is the cause of this? What's the QT? Are there electrolytes we can correct? Is magnesium appropriate? So, all right. We're going to jump to the next one and get some audience participation. Again, fast or slow, regular, irregular. QRS narrow wide, are there P waves before each QRS and is there a relationship? So who wants to take a quick stab at this one? People are still thinking around, no reports on the chat. So it's first degree AV block coming in. Great. That's it, right? Yeah. So there's yes. sometimes but there's not a yeah. trick. It's it's systematically reviewing. There's one P wave for each QRS. The PR interval is prolonged, but this rate is sustained. And again, it would be a rare individual that they would be terribly symptomatic unless they had chronotropic incompetence where their heart rate did not go up with physical activities. And that would be a rare instance. Kuz, have you ever put in a pacemaker for first degree AV block? Um, two patients who are very symptomatic. Um, they get loss of consciousness, they get dizziness, and old, old age patients. So, but very rarely we put a pacemaker for the first degree with almost so asymptomatic patients. When you yeah. say old age, so, so you're referring to someone in my age, nearly 58. Uh, is that what you're referring to? So, I'm referring to someone above 75, 80 years old. Uh, you're still yeah. young, my friend. Yes, thank you. That makes yeah. sense. <laughs> All right, so what do we get here from our audience? Again, fast, slow, regular, irregular. Are there discernible P waves 
this patient is symptomatic, but clinically stable, complaining of palpitations, mild lightheadedness, normotensive, normal oxygen saturation. So in these settings, we have time to think. Turns out the sickest patients are the easiest to take care of. If they are fast or slow and they are clinically unstable, they need electrical therapy, right? So they'll need shock or pacing. So again, I'll so state cool. that again. The sickest patients, fast, slow, clinically unstable, electricity will be required. When you have time to think, now there's options. They're clinically stable. You can be thoughtful in your approach to the patient so as not to harm them. And so what are we getting feedback on this one? So we're getting SVTs, AIVR, SVT, rapidly conducted AF, SVT, fast rail or regular SVT, SVT. Good. Good. I And again, it's it's a challenge. And, and Kuz, please, uh, if you can see the screen well, you know, are there P waves that are definitive before each QRS? Um, if, if you zoom in, it's kind of tough to see those um, P waves. But yeah. The and then the R to R, yeah. R is subtly different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. the key is that when you're struggling, if the R to R is irregular with a tachycardia, it's more than likely atrial fibrillation most of the time. And yes. treat it that way, prevent thromboembolism, and then you're administering, if the blood pressure is stable, AV nodal blocking agents to reduce the ventricular response rate. Yeah, I think part of the things people miss is uh, the, the rhythm strip. Usually people don't concentrate on the rhythm strip or on the regularity of the rhythm. Good. And, and there's so many of them say the SVT in this case, but it's an AF. Yeah, you can see the right. Interval, yeah. You, need, you need a long interval to study before you can make that conclusion. If you look at only the first five to 10 beats, it looks regular. But as you watch out over the next 20 beats, you can see the R to R variability. So I think that's that's key. Has Dr. Adams joined us? Joe, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Well, we have a guest, Dr. Joseph Adams. He's a cardiology fellow at Lutheran General Hospital. He was a, a co-course director with me at Africa STEMI for our acute cardiac care symposium. Um, he's going to be helping us as we walk through this. Welcome, Joe. And we've got Kuz. Feels like a reunion. We're back yeah. in Iraq. <laughs> Hi, Joseph. Hi, how are you? Good to be back. Um, here. Good. Good. So we, we've got our next rhythm up. Again, using our strategy, is it faster? Is it slow? Are we seeing uh, QRS narrow or wide? Is it regular or irregular? And then... This situation, again, is a clinically stable patient, occasional lightheadedness, normal tensive, normal oxygen saturation, but does get fatigued easily when they try to do their daily activities. So, uh, and Joe, you can help. I'm unable to see the chat box and keep my screen running. If you flutter, can- Flutter, flutter. Yeah. So on the chat screen, they have flutter, fluttering waves with air flutter, air flutter with typical anticlockwise, air flutter, air flutter, narrow, regular, fast, narrow, so to. So everyone's going to flutter, flutter Excellent. four to one block. Okay, so we're, we're, we're seeing some good, accurate descriptions of a bradycardic rhythm with a QRS that is probably more on the narrow side and a rhythm that looks regular, but there are multiple P waves for each QRS. The rate of the P waves, again, is fast. It's probably in that 250 to 300 range. It's variable AV block. Uh, there is a thromboembolic risk with atrial flutter, though not as great as atrial fibrillation, but they warrant antithrombotic therapy. And then depending on how long they're anticoagulated, a cardioversion could be reasonable. Ultimately, flutter can do quite well with an ablation. Um, so this is a, a treatable rhythm, but does have some morbidity associated with it. I throw this in to make things interesting because at this point in our discussion, there may be some drowsiness going in. So I'd like the audience here you can apply our rules, but there's certainly some 
concerning changes here. So we'd like to get some input. Is it fast or slow, regular, irregular, QRS duration, and then anything else that jumps out at you. And we will have future sessions to address this concern. Joe, what are you seeing in the chat boxes? Responses? Uh, nothing yet. I'm. I, I have it open though. So, well, that you know what they were really responsive till you joined us. So somehow, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think this EKG might have uh, thrown off the the rhythm. Yes, you're right. Literally, it's thrown off the rhythm. But this is why, as we're all clinicians and not working in a lab with. Uh, animals, it's important for us to be able to flex our mind. And when we get down a pathway and, and and something doesn't meet our expectations, we tend to freeze. And that's really the purpose of having this in there is remembering we're taking care of patients. The patients do not behave in the way that you would like. They don't have diagnosis that you might be prepared for at the moment. You have to be able to critically think on your feet. So are we are we getting some uh, yeah so we have uh, st depression inferior myocardial ischemia wide complex bundle branch block pacemaker rhythm omi wide qrs complex right bundle branch block right bundle branch block st depression with a possible inferior mi so okay, so take yeah. it over joe help help re redirect so I would say the the people saying uh, inferior MI with ST depressions are, you know, you do have uh, ST depressions in in lead two, but um, and also in the high, in the lateral you have in lead one as well. But if you look at V two V three the anterior leads, you see pretty profound ST elevations as well, um, and so the the ST depressions you're seeing and people are accurately noting in the inferior leads is a reciprocal change to the anterior ST elevations. There is also a bundle branch. Joe, you just cut out. So I'm going to, and I, I jumped the screen. Uh, but yes, as he was stating, ST elevation leads V1 through V4, hyperacute T waves. ST elevation one and AVL, this is an acute anterior injury current. ST elevation MI, there, and now I'm gonna to pose to the audience, what is the next step? This is vital. What do we do for this patient urgently? Kuz, you're still on the line to help? Yes, I'm there, yes, yes. I, yeah. I still remember, there, there's something in your pocket, you can pop it out. I'm sure you're roaming yeah. around with it. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we have to be very careful with our language over the internet, because that can be taken. Frequently. So, yes. I think I'm talking about your aspirins, which you carry on someone, in your pocket. Someone is listening on the World Wide Web, and then now I'm going to be getting an HR invitation. I'm talking about your aspirins. Yes, yes. Uh, we're getting, getting a lot of we're getting a lot of reperfused PCI <laughs> urgent. PCI. PCI. Activate and, cath lab. Now, what am I looking for? You're looking for a full dose aspirin. Full dose aspirin. Absolutely. And please, if you guys don't remember anything else today, when you see this pattern recognition, and I'd encourage all of you to have aspirin with you all the time, <laughs> aspirin saves lives. You in 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 the most remote areas of the world administering an aspirin has a mortality benefit. You can change the course of an acute myocardial infarction with aspirin alone. And that may be the only therapy I recognize for, for many of you in areas where there isn't a cath lab, there isn't access to thrombolytic therapy. Aspirin, 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 please. Okay. We're gonna get a quick response from the audience on this very complicated EKG. It's a tough one. What are we seeing for responses there? No more sinus rhythm, which is coming in. Another no more sinus rhythm. Excellent. So this is why 
it's so important for us to be able to critically think this is very abnormal. This is normal. Everything is relative to the normal. And so understanding normal and then being able to recognize markedly abnormal and acting on it is, is the skill set that you want to develop. Okay. This looks like a lot of fun. So let's go through fast, slow, narrow, wide, regular, irregular. Are there P waves? Joseph, you're there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you're getting some uh, sinus tack, SVT, rapid, regular, narrow, QRS, fast, negative, regular, SVT, SVT, VTAC, SVT, regular, fast, narrow. A lot of SVTs coming in. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, walk us through this one, please. So um, as people accurately described in the chat, the first thing you notice is the QRS is are very narrow. Um, and so when, when you're thinking narrow QRS and such a rapid rate, you know, you start thinking about uh, SVTs. Um, it's, the rate is very fast, so it's hard to make out P waves. Um, and so, you know, something like this, you'd want to slow it down to see what the underlying rhythm is. And um, the first thing you would try to break this rhythm are your vagal maneuvers, carotid massage, um, having the patient bear down to see if they can break this rhythm. If not, if those don't work, uh, you can always uh, use adenosine as well. Um, so, with this, and then what that'll do is it'll slow the rhythm down so that you can see what the underlying rhythm is. Correct. Good. So narrow complex tachycardia, if they're clinically unstable with this rhythm, as we stated, you simplify the ACLS algorithm, you shock them. Clinically unstable tachycardia, not sinus tachycardia, it's okay to shock them. Now, if you have access to adenosine, that's wonderful. And if you have the ability to do a, a vagal maneuver, that that will often break this rhythm. Okay, who wants to take a stab at this rhythm? It's sort of in theme. Fast or slow, narrow, wide, regular, irregular. This patient is clinically stable coming to casualty department because of some palpitations. What feedback are we getting from our audience on this? You have a pace rhythm, dual chamber pacemaker. Excellent. Uh, and maybe we should, at least on those that are saying this, maybe if you, Joe, have the name, who was who our individual that correctly identified that? So um, it is, oh, go ahead. It's Itua Barbis, Vivian Zube, um, Wilhelm, uh, Michael Tisoka, Digna. Right. Let's start Vigna. to acknowledge uh, the individuals who are correct. It's human nature. There's nothing better than getting recognition. And I think in medicine, we're not good at that. Uh, we're getting better. We need to educate people. We need to elevate them, right? We need to increase your belief that you can be an effective and uh, outstanding clinician. So it's good to get that feedback. All humans like that. I like it. So at any time during the presentation, you guys want to say nice things about me, I will accept uh, all of that. This is a little bit of who we are. This is what we do. Uh, Joseph Adams is now an integral part of our team. Dr. Kuz, we are collaborating with Dr. Mohammed Jalen in Nairobi, we are collaborating with. AJ Hale is now a connector and collaborator. So we look forward to interacting with all of you. And we uh, we have a website, there's a QR code. Uh, we have trained over a thousand in advanced cardiac life support with our partners, the MedSwipe team in Nairobi. 
Um, so we we enjoy this realm and we hope to expand uh, the individuals that work with us and that we work with. Okay, uh, timing wise, AJ, I'm gonna, you know, we went through some important concepts. There are a number of cases here, but I wanna take a pause and sort of get maybe feedback from the audience. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Oh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Just know that um, you can either raise your hand and I think we can allow you to talk. Either um, please. AJ can do that or- well, can see, um, Please you can introduce, introduce yourself. They may know you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is Ichomaya Kuro. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist out of Houston, also part of the Cardiovascular Education Foundation. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, thank you, Dr. Patel, for giving this talk today. It's been um, really excellent. We got a lot of teaching, covered a lot of important concepts. Um, so I just wanted to kind of let everybody know what they could do if they wanted to speak or if they had any questions, you can definitely put it in the chat, but also um, raise your hand and um, AJ can uh, let you speak. Dr. Patel, there is a question. Do we, from, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, OR, do we pace AFib flutter with slow ventricular response. Excellent. Well, we've got such we've got talent on the line here. So let's let's put it to our moderators. Please chime in. Ijioma. We may have lost. We may have lost our yeah. Puz, go ahead. Do we pace slow AFib? We only pay slow AFib when they are symptomatic, uh, when they come and uh, they're symptomatic, slow flutter, or slow AFib with symptoms. And uh, if you rule out all the cause and if you stop the medications which they are on for rate control and still they're symptomatic, then yes, they end up having a single pace chamber pace method just to come back to their um, normal rhythm in terms of rate. Uh, other than that, we don't put in place them. Yeah. Yeah. So I think an important concept: clinically unstable, fast or slow, electrical therapy. So regardless of the rhythm, if they're clinically unstable, you may need to pace. And then, if they're clinically unstable and fast, and not in sinus tachycardia, you may need to shock. And I think that's an important theme I want you to take home today to, to, to simplify the ACLS algorithm. Make it so you can add knowledge to some basic concepts that we're introducing today. And that's why I wanted to pause there. I think it's really important. Uh, more questions or comments? That was an excellent statement and comment. I think Parag, you can carry on. Um, so again, this is a algorithm. Again, I'd encourage you to take a screenshot of because it's the step towards simplifying the recognition of rhythms and then which ones to act on. And so as I spoke earlier, when you go down the red side there, if you have no pulse, that's the easiest patient to take care of. It causes us a great deal of anxiety, but it's simple. You need to perfuse their brain. You have to do CPR immediately and continuously. You have to call for help. You need to then determine, once you have leads on the patient, is, the, is there a rhythm? And if what is the rhythm? But if there's a rhythm and no pulse, we call it pulseless electrical activity. There are a certain number of things that cause that. And when we're doing procedures, many of us, it's most likely something we've done, a mechanical rupture of the vascular system, usually cardiac perforation, leads to cardiac tamponade where you get a heart rhythm, but no pulse, pulseless electrical activity. The only treatment for that is the removal of the fluid from the pericardium a pericardiocentesis. 
if you're in VF, the only treatment for ventricular fibrillation is a shock. But until that shock's administered, it's continuous and effective CPR, chest compressions. You see, as the patient gets stable, now we have many different options. Is there a pulse? Are they awake? Again, moving down the right side of the green, is it fast or slow? Is it a stable bradycardia? If it's fast, is it wide or narrow? Is it VT or not? Is it an SVT, right? So we have different pathways. If they become unstable, again, you can go as you see the orange boxes where they are, they have a pulse, but they're unstable. Now we walked out and you see again, in the end, clinically unstable, either pace for bradycardia or shock for tachycardia. So this is the simplification of the entire ACLS algorithm. Take a screenshot. Um, I have to credit Dr. Erin Nasrallah. She's not on the line. She's our medical director for coming up with this. We've been using it to teach. And again, I think it's very effective. It goes well with the basic pathway and then this is the extension of the basic pathway. Have it with you. It just, it takes the anxiety out of trying to determine how to act and when to act when you have uh, a cardiac rhythm abnormality. Okay. Uh, let's uh, talk about this case. Uh, and Joe, you want to do a quick uh, review of this? You can read it out to them. So uh, this is a patient that's coming in with uh, fatigue, um, especially when he's exerting himself. 64-year-old, oh, I'm sorry, female. 64-year-old female um, coming to the primary care doctor with this. Uh, denies any chest pain, uh, lower extremity edema, dizziness, palpitations, or recent illness. Last seen two weeks ago, during which her diltiazam was increased in the outpatient office. Good. And so again... You've got the medicines there. You've got the cardiac exam. It's irregular. All right, here's our rhythm strip here. So who wants to take a stab at this one? And again, we'll go through some of these quickly since we've covered some of it. And certainly chime in uh, via audio or video. We'd love to see your face. If you do, please just tell us where you are from. Let's get some location so we can understand where the audience is at. Um, Etua Marvis says complete heart block. Bernard says wanky Bach. Excellent. And, and please, when you do the chat, tell us where you are residing. It will again allow us to maybe understand our audience better. So please text in, or again, I encourage you, we'd love to see you on video. Right now, I'm the only one on video and feeling a little anxious about myself and my, my self-esteem, but we yes. Some wanky box, some Mobitz type one, some Mobitz type two, and Mulo Anyodi from Dar Salaam, says complete heart block. Uh, Zabadia says bradycardia, Mobitz type 1. Joseph Kazara, Tanzania, Mobitz type 1. Um, so we're getting a mix between Wanky Bach, Mobitz type 1. Okay. So Yachty from the UK, Nottingham, says second degree Mobitz type 1. Okay. So what is the conclusion? What does our panelists tell us? Joe, take over. What is the rhythm? Did I lose you, Joe? I lost Joe. Sorry, can you hear? Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. So, in the middle of the rhythm strip, you have um, three beats that are nicely laid out, and sometimes this is a strategy I use. Like, if you have um, continuous beats on the rhythm strip. That's where I usually like to focus because you can kind of get a better idea of what exactly is going on. So that first beat in the middle of the strip, um, you see 
there's a P wave QRS, right? The next beat, the P wave, the P, uh, the P wave to QRS interval gets longer. The PR interval gets longer. Then the third beat, the PR interval gets longer than that. So you have increasing PR intervals, beat to beat to beat, and then you get a P wave with a drop beat. So this is Wanky Bach. Excellent. All right. So now I apologize because I have created something I'm trying to get. So out just, of. just can you make it clear what type of welcome back it is? Um, so this is the one which is a follow PR continuously and then a drop of a sinus bit. People do it between more bits type and welcome back. Yeah, and there's a lot of first time we get questions and what is a Vancouver back and what is a mobile type. So if we can bring it out to the audience. Did you get that, Joe? So right, we so, want to just yeah, go ahead. So um this is Mobits type one, uh, which is uh, wanky Bach is another name for it. So Mobitz type one or wanky Bach. Um, the difference between Mobitz type one and type two is that uh, the Mobitz type one, you have this, again, this PR uh, increasing interval B to B then with a drop B. Mobitz type two, you don't have, um, you, you, there's no, the PR interval does not change, but you will get drop beats. Mobitz type two is, um, more concerning clinically and can be indication for pacemaker. Mobitz type one typically, um, generally speaking, is not um, is not as concerning and not something we put pacemakers in. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joseph. All right. Let me see. Okay. I'm going to jump to the next case. In the interest of time. All right. Let's get some feedback on this. This is now an individual who does have some symptoms, had syncope, 58-year-old, um, new onset of symptoms, blood pressure at the moment stable, this is the 12 lead electrocardiogram. Let's get some feedback on this. What are we hearing? There? Bernard says third degree. Digna says high degree AB block. Excellent. So, so atrial rate of 100 from Michael, David, uh, sorry, they're going fast here. Antenna from Ethiopia, third degree. Um, Emmanuel's complete heart block. K, third degree heart block. Um, Itua, high grade block, Southampton, UK. Um People from Nigeria, high degree AB block. Okay, good. I so I, I are you getting feedback from me? You're, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Yes. I was just able to see uh, the chat box on my phone now, so that's great. All right, so you're spot on. Uh, complete heart block, AV dissociation, bradycardia. Now, at the moment, the individual is clinically stable, but has exhibited signs of instability by syncope. So unless this is a reversible cause of heart block, an acute inferior wall myocardial infarction, which we don't see evidence of, or some other metabolic or systemic disease, this patient most likely is going to need a pacemaker, ideally a dual chamber pacemaker to maintain AV synchrony. Um, and they should certainly feel substantially better. Um, other comments from our moderators? Yes, so um, there, was, uh, there was a comment saying that high degree AV block, 
so which is almost like a third degree AV block, but this is like a fixed uh, C21 AV block. If you see there are three P waves and then a QRS complex, you can even have a high degree AV block, a C21, kind of a fixed uh, high degree AV block. Yeah, and one other thing too, just um for the for people in the audience, just so you can notice this, is that if you see the PR intervals are not always the same. So that second beat there, that P is not conducting that QRS. It's too close together. Then you can see it's a little different in the second, third, fourth beat. They're all a little different because those P's are completely dissociated with the QRS. So those short PR intervals, that is not that P wave is not conducting that, that beat. Good. Thank you for that. So we talked about reversible, irreversible, right? And a long list, but really common things we want to evaluate immediately. And that's ischemic heart disease always, because that is a reversible cause, particularly with inferior wall ischemia, the heart block will resolve as you open up the vessel or shortly after that. Okay, let's get to, again, these are a general slide on what pacing is, uh, placing the leads traditionally through the venous system into the right ventricle, at least ideally in a patient like this, a dual chamber where the right atrial lead is also placed. Um, we talked about the medical treatments, right, using atropine, uh, a a beta agonist and vasopressor such as dopamine or norepinephrine, and then doing transcutaneous pacing until you have access to transvenous, uh, transitioning to the permanent pacemaker. Uh, uh, Farag, um, according to your experience, how effective is dopamine in such cases? How effective is dopamine? Atropine, atropine. Oh, and atropine. In someone with, yeah, yeah, so we get lots of patients from upcoming who has outlook and they don't have a transcutaneous space maker. Sure, sure. And they need to tra travel all the way to a cathedral where they can do a space maker or put a temporary. Yeah. Um, from a, those remote areas, yes. Um, yeah, it's not an effective long-term strategy. It's only a short-term. And in, in more advanced cases of complete heart block where the escape rhythm is coming from very distal in the his Purkinje system, you're going. You're not going to get any response from atropine, and there's a theoretic concern you could actually make the rhythm worse. So, it's not a good therapy. Uh, a vasopressor and beta agonist is better if you can get it on board. Infuse that continuously. You might uh, activate the escape rhythm to be a little faster uh, through beta agonism. But yeah, our medical therapy for bradyarrhythmia is 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 not is less than ideal. So to the audience, uh, Global Fix have been doing a lot of stuff um, all over Africa, especially in Kenya, advocating the emergency services and SLS and BLS protocol. And they've been donating also um, ADs in, and they also donated a, um, AD, AD to us as well. And so thank you very much, Global Fix, for doing this thing about how to handle emergencies in remote areas as well. So keep it up for the things you do. And your team with Matt right? Uh, oh, you know what? It's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure partnering with you and the team in Dar es Salaam and and all the other uh, individuals we've been fortunate. To. And remind me, I still have to get you pacing pads. I have them in Nairobi for your defib. Yes, yes, yes. yes Please check with Carolyn. She has them, and if someone's in Nairobi, they can pick them up. So those online, um, they can go to the website, the FIX website, the MetRipe. You can do an online ACLS BLS course as well, um, which is minimal cost, which is there. And uh, I think in the end of the session, you can just brief us on this as well. So people can take advantage while in a remote areas who can't access ACLS BLS course um, physically. Yes. Again, I think this online session that we're meeting again this is just some of our background uh, there's the qr code to our website uh how are we doing for time we had slightly late start but i want to be mindful uh we were trying to keep it in the 45 to 50 minute range um 
we're getting about to that hour or so. So I don't know if we have general questions from the group that could be helpful um, just from your experience. And then we can pick this back up in a week or two. Excellent. Yeah. And again, please uh, use the next few minutes. Um, we're happy as a team of moderators to engage in conversation. Um, maybe, AJ, can you give us a, an overview of which countries participants are involved in? Because this is our first uh, trans or international truly presentation for Global Fix. Yeah, um, absolutely. No, so we have a lot of representation, a ton of people from uh, East Africa, it looks like Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda. We also have people from West Africa in Nigeria, Ghana. Um, and then I believe we also have some joining us from uh, Pakistan as well as India and the UK. So we definitely have a global perspective here, I would say. That's it. It's, it's outstanding. This is this type of engagement. And again, I encourage you as we have these in the future to the audience, uh, please, please chime in. Uh, I found when we do these presentations in person, uh, it's all about getting you slightly uncomfortable, but then confident and feeling safe in, in, in speaking up so you can learn. And, and when you have to put yourself on the line and have situational awareness and be able to recognize, you'll feel your confidence improving so you can add the next level of sophistication. And it's so important that we all have a foundational basis and, and grow from there. And I think that's what we hope to bring to the table uh, to an already uh, experienced and, uh, and you know talented group of educators that are a part of the foundation. Um, we're, we're hoping that from the bottom up, we can build some foundational basis for your knowledge and action because it's action that saves lives and sometimes it's the act of not doing something that becomes the safest thing for the patient and we want to we want to try to walk you through some of the strategies we found to be successful in teaching throughout the US and uh now in in the East African and hopefully the the African realm And I, I really, you know, it's been fantastic. Like I said, it was it was amazing to see you uh, all do your presentation in perfect, uh, person at Africa Semi, and you know, offering these online free uh, free access is only going to accelerate things. So we still have folks chiming in with uh, where they're from, and definitely uh, appreciate everybody sharing where you're where you're from and how this has uh, helped to improve your access. We're getting a couple of questions here. Um... One is uh, use of defib to help in pacing can be a bit challenging at times. Could we? Could you do a demo on this? And yeah. uh, what we, do we you certainly do for the future? We we can you know now that we have some structure and I and we have an idea of the audience. Um, I I think we can do simulations virtually and we can walk you through. We could do a session on pacing and defibrillation from our Sunday would be tough, but we could record a session uh, in our simulation lab uh, and be able to offer it online to walk through the, the technique, uh, the pitfalls uh, on how to pace and defibrillate using a monitored defibrillator. Uh, but we would, that that's actually something we've talked about doing and this would be a great forum to launch it in. Excellent. Well, um, but, well, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Patel, for uh, for this amazing uh, you know presentation. I think we all learned a lot today, and we're going to make sure to post this on YouTube so everyone can have access and learn from it. Uh, we also had some requests for access to the slides. So if you don't mind sharing, I think that would be very helpful. And then, uh, uh, you know. Joe, uh, Joe will take charge of that. He'll share you the deck. You leave it okay. to me, will get it in sometime 2028. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, AJ, maybe, maybe if you give me your, uh, text me your email just so I can send it to you. And then you, I'm sure you'll have a better way to give it to, to send it out to everybody. So um, I can send it to you. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll go ahead. Once I get it, I'll get it posted into our WhatsApp group um, where we have all of our masterclass uh, conversations about when the next course is and what we're covering. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on WhatsApp. Uh, for those of you who have it, I won't give it on this horrible <laughs> forum, but uh, we'll pass it along. And once again, from the Dennis and Jane Reese Foundation, from the Cardiovascular Education Foundation, from all of us in this global cardiovascular collaborative, we really appreciate everyone being involved and we're super excited to see what comes next. Thank you. Thank you, And thank you, team. Thank you, Parag and Joseph and everyone who's online. And hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Right. Thank you. All the best. Good night. Thank you. Good night.